So our next speaker, uh, she is one of the founders of the ex Muslims of North America, and she currently is employed as a director of outreach and development for that organization. Please welcome Sarah Hayter. Moral purity is the most important thing. 
Um, and she, her worth as a human being is tied strongly to that. Um, additionally, in Muslim cultures, there's a sense of westernization is sexualization. So if anyone starts adopting Western thoughts and Western beliefs, including liberalism and progressivism, that this person will inevitably become sexualized. And of course, for a woman, that's the worst possible thing. Um, in addition to that, that leads to feminism is a Western construct, and therefore it's not it's not uh, good for a Muslim woman to start adopting feminist traits because they are Western and Western thoughts leads to sexualization. Um, I mean, and additionally, uh, women have fewer rights than men in almost every aspect, and I just listed a few there, and some of them are including uh, legal. It's pretty pretty prevalent. Uh, where most people are aware, the testimony of two female witnesses is equivalent to that of one male. Um, a woman receives half the inheritance of a man in the case of rape. A woman must provide four witnesses to prove her case. And if you can imagine, that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, how can you how can you possibly provide four people that are just standing around uh, as your rape is happening, and then you know will go to court with you? Um, in the country where where that that uh, became law. Happened in Pakistan uh, under the Hudud Ordinance, uh, no men were convicted for rape at the time that this, this uh, practice was um, set in stone. Um, crimes committed on the basis of honor often have lessened punishments in Muslim countries, and it's legal, ironically, for a man to beat his wife for uh, disobedience. This is considered his right as a husband. Um, then there are social. Um, social ramifications uh, that are, I think, in some ways even more powerful. Um, and, and that is mostly that a woman that steps out of these bounds, especially the moral, sexual bounds, um, is shunned or otherwise coerced into, into behaving. And if not, then you end her life. And then that's when you have something you call an honor. And these restrictions have enormous influence on any society that accepts Islam. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit, what is the Muslim response to this, right? And this is something that's so prevalent, and women are second class citizens, and they are living in what would you would call very restricted, almost, uh, I, I mean, it's hard to almost a servant-like life. Um, what is the Muslim response to this? And that is at that of most, I think, most um, religions um, and most believers when they're confronted with something like this about their faith, which is that of denial. This doesn't happen. Statistics, these statistics are not real. They are making it up. Um, this is uh, uh, this study was funded by this Western, you know, company or this Western organization. And therefore, these results are to be trusted, and they're there to the smarts that I know from. So, complete denial. Um, and even in my own family, so I was talking to my father about uh, a case of a woman who was. Uh, who was gang raped, and she wasn't just gang raped uh, by random people, she it was a tribal court appointed gang rape. Um, she had to be the one to pay for her brother's crime, and the payment was gang raped by five men. Um, and so I was talking to my family about this, and my father's response was, and this is it, this is all he said, rape doesn't happen in Pakistan. That was the end of the discussion right there. We didn't, we didn't discuss uh, the point the conflict in that this particular um, case we didn't talk about you know the background the culture where it doesn't happen that's it it doesn't happen um, then there's the what I call two wrongs maker right and this is what this is something like <clears throat> well it, it may be true that in Saudi Arabia we have you know women that are being stoned but in America you have women that are going around in bikinis mm -hmm. and it, it's a, it's a, it's equivalent in their minds number one which is ridiculous but but also that the fact that something bad happens in a Western or a liberal country makes it okay for these bad things to happen in ours. Uh, another response is what I call apologism, which is essentially a selective reading of the Quran and Hadith. And that's when they will pick just a few phrases in the Quran or a few stories or anecdotes about you know, the Prophet and his followers that make it seem as if women are actually quite respected and are exalted in Islam and they, they enjoy this favored status. And growing up, I actually believed that. I thought that as a Muslim woman, I had the kind of rights that aren't given to any other religion. I thought that Islam, and, and it, you know, it, it may be even the case that when Islam came into the picture back in the day, it, it gave women rights that maybe some religions didn't. But it's a far cry from being on any level with, with religions now. 
Um, another response is what I call blame shifting, which is essentially, I mean, the most common one is uh, the West is to blame. And that will take place, well, we have XYZ problems, and that's because of colonialism, or it's due to um, Western intervention, and that's why we have the problem, therefore we are not uh, responsible in any way. Now, of course, you can argue that, that Western influence has had a, a play in making things worse in the Muslim world. You can argue that, there's, uh, and I think legitimately. However, this is often used to absolve religion of guilt completely. Um, the most pervasive in the media, and the one that I'd like to focus on today, is um, anytime that, uh, say, something like honor killings or FGM or violence against women in general comes up, uh, there's a statement, and it happened, it crops up at some point, and it's, well, it's the culture, not the religion. And you'll hear this everywhere. You will hear this from uh, Muslims, you will hear this from the West. Um, and so, so the Western response, I'm going to go over that a little bit, because I was actually quite shocked by what I found to be the Western response to violence against women in Muslim countries. Um, there's a right-wing reaction, which we know what, what their reaction is, which is um, largely counterproductive, demonize Muslims, which I think is a very negative thing to do, you can demonize, say, a religion to some extent, but you can't demonize a people, which is what they do. And I think, harmfully, it's motivated by, and not, of course not every time, but I think more, more often than I'm comfortable with, it's motivated by bigotry or by xenophobia. Um, then there is uh, the left-wing reaction, uh, which has been just strongly disappointing to me. I've had, um, it's hard for me to talk about. It has been I do consider myself a progressive, liberal, Western person. Um, but I've been disappointed by the left-wing reaction. Um, and this is with the exception of the skepticism and uh, atheist communities, which is that why do we do acquiesce with the whole it's culture, not religion, uh, mantra that Muslims repeat. Um, and it, it, when that phrase comes up, it's, religion, it's culture, not religion, usually it's used to shut down the conversation altogether. Once you said, oh, it's culture, not religion, that's a cue to say, okay, let's stop talking about religion, let's not bring Islam into the picture, and we are not going to discuss it. So anytime you see in the media, look at a panel of, of people that are supposed to be experts on Islam or experts on the Middle East, somebody will say, pretty early on, let's remember it's the culture, not the religion. And that's a cue for us to know, don't talk about religion, don't mention it. And of course, I think it's important, um, I think it's an important thing because uh, we as the left, we as progressives and liberals, I think it's our duty to uphold humanist values and to uphold human rights. And when we completely cross out uh, something as important and as influential as religion from the debate altogether, there can be no progress. A lot of people talk about, well, they're waiting for it, almost. Like they're, they're waiting for, when will reformist Islam come? When will Islam be modernized? And why are you the Muslim majority pushing up in the silent, uh, peaceful Muslim majority, as it goes? Why aren't they speaking up? Um, and I think it's difficult for any religion to be reformed on any level if you're not able to criticize it, if you're not able to talk about it in public without being the bigot. So this, I think, leads to a culture of censure, and I think that's very harmful, um, and you can probably understand why. Um, criticism of religion is taken off the table completely when it comes to Islam. Um, no one wants to be deemed a bigot. No one wants to be deemed racist. So we want to be tolerant of all beliefs and all ideas. And I think that what, what happens is that we do not give Islam the same kind of treatment that we would give Christianity um, or that we would give Judaism. Um, and this, I think that this creates this, this very tough thing position, especially for somebody like me, an ex-Muslim. I'm trying to speak out about this, but it's hard for me to go about it without even, and people even tell me this, that I'm an idiot. Um, or uh, an Uncle Tom, that's what I've been called before as well, for speaking about this. Um, there's also all the claims of Islamophobia, if you ever speak about it now. I think it's just a ridiculous, uh, I think it's a ridiculous statement, uh, phrase. I don't think you can believe, you know, it, it's one thing to say you're a Muslimophobe, you're afraid of these people, you're demonizing people, which I think is a negative thing and a harmful thing. But I think it's perfectly acceptable to criticize your religion, and it's even rational sometimes to be you know, afraid of it to some extent. 
Um, then there's a climate um, center within the Muslim community, which is the women that speak out about women's, women's violence, uh, violence against women in the Muslim world are punished severely, and this is usually by the family, um, which is what makes it the most uh, horrifying thing, in my opinion. Uh, there was something I was reading uh, about, it was a research study of court cases of homicide in Jordan, I think it was in 1995, and what it found that out of the women that were, that were killed in the country, uh, the great majority of them were killed by their brother, and the great majority of them for honor related. Um, another example of this is uh, the woman who thought my, and I mentioned her earlier, she was the one that was uh, gang raped, a uh, court appointed gang raped, tribal court appointed, who went out and started speaking about it. She talked to Western media and liberal media about it. And what, what happened to her? Um, she was, her passport was confiscated by the Pakistani government because they believed that she was harming the country and the image of, of Pakistan and of Islam and altogether. So she was forbidden from leaving the country. She is now a villain. And nobody, uh, as, far, as far as I know, they, the moderate, average Pakistani doesn't believe her. They think she's lying. They think she's making this up. Um, then there's Malala Yousafzai, Yus and we know Malala, and a lot of people have heard of her. She's um, the young girl, I think she was 15, uh, when she was shot in the head by the Taliban for uh, speaking for women's education. So she was shot in the head, and she started speaking at the UN and in you know, Western audiences or whatever. And for doing that, uh, most people don't know this, she is a villain in Pakistan. She's considered a horrible human being. She's considered a sellout. She's considered herself as being paid by the West. And this is so common. Anytime I say, and if you poke around sort of in sort of Pakistani forums and uh, Facebook pages, pages and stuff, you'll see this. Um, and this is the kind of problem that we're talking about. And even a woman that talks about something, something almost everyone can support, women's education. She's villainized. Um, in fact, I, um, Malala has a biography that is banned in most Pakistan schools. Um, so additionally, I want to talk about what is the influence of religion anyway? Like how can we, what is the difference between saying it's culture and it's not culture? Um, there's a Pew survey that went out, and it talks about uh, how Muslims who want Sharia to be the law of the land are often less likely to support equal rights for women. And there, I think, we see a direct connection between the religious right and how favorable they are of women's rights. And this is obvious to, to progressives and to the left, but it isn't obvious um, to the average person. There was a Newsweek study uh, in 2011, which talked about the rights and quality of life of women around the world, and eight out of the bottom ten were Muslim majority countries, which I think is very telling. And there were Muslim majority countries from all over the world. There were African countries, there were South Asian countries. And this leads me to sort of my next point. It's weird to say it's religion, not or it's, it's culture, not religion, because Islam is multicultural. There are African Muslims, there are South Asian Muslims, there are Middle Eastern Muslims, and they abide by very different cultural norms. The one thing they do have in common is Islam. And even we'll say, uh, for what I have up there, the difference between Somali culture versus the Pakistani culture versus the Kuwaiti culture. Here we're talking about three countries with completely different socioeconomic backgrounds. Countries that have very different histories, countries that have very different ethnicities. Um, but they treat women with the same kind of people. So what is going on? What is the commonality? Um, so I sort of wanted to end a little bit. Um, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's only religion, and religion is the root cause of all of evil. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there, there are, of course, there are many factors that contribute to the creation of a culture that permits violence against women. Islam doesn't have a monopoly on misogyny. And there are many patriarchal countries all over the world. We know this. Um, but what I want to argue is that uh, religion acts as a break on cultural progress. Um, sometimes it even perverts cultural progress. It has done in, in the past, in my, my home country, in Pakistan, where it, it used to be, it was founded as actually a secular country, most people don't know this, um, or with the intent of being a secular country. And in the 70s, a bunch of Islamist laws were put into place, including the law that makes, uh, that, uh, um, forces women to show up before witnesses to a rape, and these laws push the country in backwards. Um, another example uh, is 
but uh, um, just sort of to end, it, humans, I think, have a responsibility to acknowledge and advocate for the scrutiny of all oppressive systems. And I think this is, in some cases, where the liberal side sort of fails on this responsibility, in that we don't need the same kind of equal scrutiny we would give anything else. And, and so I, I think this is very important. To, for us as secondaries, for us as atheists, to be speaking about, to not accept its culture, not religion, as an excuse. And I think that would be the way forward. And I'm open to a few questions. I think I have a few minutes. And also, I, I just want to uh, thank you so much for making that point about um, you know culture, not religion. I'm, I'm finding this uh, same problem. I'm uh, really interested in Thailand, and they have this crazy law where they think the uh, the king is is like godlike, and so you're not allowed to say anything against the king. And it is so frustrating to me that as I'm trying to raise awareness about hundreds of people who are thrown in jail because they, you know, were in a taxi cab and they started talking politics and, and somebody recorded them. And this, this happened like two weeks ago. And I'm not bringing, dragging up old things. And another person who, uh, a student who wrote a play about a fictional king, thrown in jail. Literally, this, these things happened within a month. And, and there's, you know, three new people last month thrown in jail over nothing for this king, who's a pretty good guy. However, you know, um, anyway, I won't go on and on about that, but it has been so frustrating to get my liberal friends interested in this. And it's actually the conservative friends will just go, that's insane. And the liberals will go, well, you know, we don't want to criticize them. That's their culture. And, you know, I keep going, it's a human right, okay? It's a human right to be able to speak your mind. Anyway, um, I just have one question. Uh, which is a question uh, that I don't know the answer to. What is a court-appointed court rape? Is, is, is rape allowed in some cases in Islam? Well, it's, um, it's, it's different according to different schools of law. Now, a lot of, uh, from what I understand of Islamic law, it's, it's tribalistic to some extent. And different, different countries have different sort of interpretations of it. Uh, the way it is done in Pakistan is that the, and I mean, this goes back to owning a woman's body. And a woman's body is actually, it belongs to her family, it belongs to her father or her brother or her husband after that. Um, so if, it goes back to the idea of if he did the crime, it is, you can punish him by getting her raped. Uh, because her honor is now besmirched, therefore his honor is besmirched, and that's, uh, that, that's equitable justice. And sort of talking about your, your point when you're talking about tolerance and I think, I think when tolerance is something that, that comes into conflict with human rights, I think it's a moral obligation to choose human rights. And otherwise, yes, we should try to be as tolerant as possible. Um, yeah. I had a question about the uh, like the math of the, the two witnesses, the two female witnesses equal one male witness. Um, like you said, four witnesses per per rape. Is that four female witnesses? Is it, like, is four it two or oh, four male witnesses? From, so, I mean, and of course, this is uh, this is all written in the Quran in a, in a very sometimes way or Quran and the Sharia in vague language. But some people interpret it as four male witnesses so and be eight. eight. Oh my. <laughs> We have time for uh, one more question, Owen. Uh, are there any organizations you would recommend uh, getting behind to help fight not only this kind of thing abroad, but also the stuff that goes on here in America? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I know, um, so she's somebody who's considered quite right now, but uh, I am one of the who does work on FGM related issues. Um, there are a lot of local groups that work, and I can't um, name them at the top of my head, 
uh, but there are local um, women's rights groups that work within um, Muslim countries that we can maybe, I think the best way to do it would be just to, to fund them probably, help them with our dollars. Um, but so far as I know, I don't know of anyone that's, that, that, that's outspokenly secular. So that's something to consider. It's important. It's just one. Okay, real quick. Yes, just one minute. First of all, FGM, which is female Gentile, you know, creation is not an Islamic school. Like Iran, Saudi, Iraq, they don't do it. They do it on Egypt because it's cultural. And when we say this cultural, is not excused, but it's the truth of what we can do. Right? For witness? No. It's different. Right? It's a crime. There's nothing about this. Gain rape? It's not. Are you, are you Muslim? Yes, sir. You're Muslim. Gain rape? Okay. There's no status about it. <laughs> uh, nine years marriage. Okay. All people need to understand the difference between Hadith and Quran. Hadith is written 200 years after Prophet Muhammad. Hadith, some Muslims accept some of it and some Muslims reject some of it. Because it's not some truth like Quran. So we cannot compare and say both, both equal. Uh, honor crime. Honor crime is something wrong and we need to focus on it. I sent you an email and told you that's it. Let's have some conversa conversations so at least American people know what the difference between uh, like Islam, between the extremists. You told me you are focusing on increasing tolerance of religion, uh, not uh, talking about Islam itself, but about tolerance. But this is about Islam itself. And for people who, who cannot read the Quran, they have a little bit knowledge about Islam. We need to explain to them because today, like everyone here, can go to Portugal. Google the FGM and he will know many, many, the biggest countries, Muslim countries like Iran, Saudi, Iraq, they don't do it. So we cannot say all schools accept it. This is wrong. Uh, Prophet Muhammad and his, his marriage nine years old. Yeah, well, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. So that's a, I'm, I'm, I, there's too much. I covered a lot of this already in my speech. If anyone has any questions, they can email me. But this is pretty common, this kind of thing. Which is Complete denial of what's going on. A complete denial. I don't believe. I accept. I said that's not happening. This is bad. But we need to. But so we're not agreeing on the cause of it. We're not agreeing on what what factors play into it. We don't need to agree. We just need to give point our point of view so people can judge. We cannot give them one point of view. Okay. Uh, I think we're out of time for Sarah. So please give her. A